Hello everyone, I am Berke Tezergil and today I'm going to talk about the history of Volkswagen. Uh, I'm going to divide my presentation into two parts, namely Volkswagen before and during World War II and then Volkswagen after World War II. I chose this topic because uh, nowadays we see a lot of Volkswagen cars in the streets today, such as Golf, Polo and Transporter. Uh, so it, would be my, it, it was interesting for me and I, was, I wanted to inform you about this. Uh, let me begin with the foundation of Volkswagen. Actually, Volkswagen was the brainchild of Adolf Hitler. He wanted his people to have a car for an ordinary people. Uh, thus, Volk meaning people in German and Der Wagen meaning car. So he approached one of the prominent designers of the time, Ferdinand Porsche, to design a car, which was this, the first Beetle. And uh, he very actively made this propaganda on this car, uh, calling it, so far as calling it KDF Wagen, KDF meaning Kraft durch Freude, which means strength through joy in German, uh, in English. And uh, this, in a sense, was very successful because it gave Germans a car at a very cheap price, namely 990 Reichsmarks, which was approximately 33 months of income, average income for a German family. And it, it could house five people and had a top speed of 100 kilometers per hour, which was actually very suitable for the autobahns built at that time. But Hitler's plans did not come into fruition as he hoped because of the World War II. And uh, due to the World War II, Volkswagen had to shift its production to the uh, wartime materials, as with all other industries in the Germany. Mainly in the war, they produced two models, first being Kübelwagen and second being Schwimmwagen. Kübelwagen was an all-purpose jeep used by the uh, German army called Wehrmacht and it was what jeep was to the Americans. It was the icon of the uh, German army. It was very well liked by the troops. And Schwimmwagen was an amphibious variant which could swim in uh, all bodies of water, excluding an ocean of course. And uh, after this point we know that uh, Hitler lost, uh, German lost the World War II and it came into uh, Allied occupation. And uh, Volkswagen factory itself came into British occupation zone and the British intervened, of course, because of the high, high industry in the area. And they put Major Ivan Hurst in, uh, in charge of the factory. He was a very important person for the Volkswagen because had he not been there, Volkswagen wouldn't exist today as we know it. And uh, he was very active in the rebuilding of Volkswagen because he could just dismantle the factory and send it back to Britain. Instead, he just uh, wanted to create employment for the people over there. And uh, even so that, he managed to persuade the British Army to have an order of 20,000 cars, which opened a huge employment to the uh, citizens of the KDF Stadt, which was the uh, state Volkswagen factory was located. And here we can see the thousandth car leaving the uh, factory and Major Ivanhurst on the driving seat. Moreover, uh, the British saw the repercussions and they said that they could only have 10% of the 1936 car production as to limit the industry. Uh, but this did not stop Volkswagen from being what it is today. Uh, as we can see here in 1949, it was reformed as a trust under the state of West Germany and uh, state of Lower Saxony, it is still in a sense a governmental organization and uh, in 15 years they managed to expand to the whole of the world as we know today, even uh, opening factories in England, South Africa, Brazil and Australia and making exports to all over worldwide, excluding the communist countries of course because of their isolationist policies and uh, things were going very well for them but they did not have a lot of models. Here we can see two of their models, the one on the left being Volkswagen Transporter, which was very iconic on, uh, for the hippies, and the one on the right being Volkswagen Beetle Cabriolet, which was their third model, uh, third popular model and the last. But as I said, like, lack of the models uh, brought a halt to the Volkswagen's expansionist policy, and they had to introduce new models because of the uh, drop in the sales. So uh, they started aggressively designing new models and putting them to the market. Here we can see some of them, such as uh, Volkswagen uh, Squareback, uh, which was designed as a station wagon to be used by the families. The second being Volkswagen Passat, which was introduced in 1975 and having a huge success on the American market. 
And the last being Volkswagen Polo, which was introduced in 1979 and again was a huge success in the American market. Here, with these three models, they managed to gain another uh, breakthrough, let's say, in the uh, American market. But uh, these models could not hold on their own for 10 years, so the same thing happened in the 1990s. So much so dire that the uh, sales of the Volkswagen had an all-time low in the uh, 1993, having only 50,000 50, 50, units sold annually. So they had to intervene to the uh, market and with this intervention came in three new models. First being Volkswagen Vento, which was the uh, precursor of Volkswagen Passat and Jetta as we know today. Uh, the new Beetle, uh, actually not the new Beetle anymore because in 19, uh, 2016 Volkswagen introduced a newer Beetle still. And the last being uh, Golf Mark IV, Golf IV generation. These two together, because the Beetle came in uh, at the beginning of the new millennium, made a, managed to make an increase of 700% in the sales of USA, with the numbers being 350,000 in just five years. This was a huge success for the Volkswagen because they managed to have, again, a very superior position in the US market. And let me, so let me end my presentation with some of the uh, information as of Volkswagen today. Uh, first being in the, in the recent years, they have been uh, following a policy of modernization and further expansion into new areas such as biodiesel, hybrid cars and automotive security. And today it is the second largest manufacturer worldwide since uh, four years and not just automotive manufacturer, it is the second largest industry in the world. And uh, it is currently the largest automaker in Europe. And this uh, too alone shows how successful it is in the last 70 years of its career, let's say. Uh, to sum up today, I've talked about Volkswagen's history, mainly two, uh, dividing it into two periods. The first being Volkswagen before and during World War II, and the second being Volkswagen after World War II. And the uh, moral that I managed to learn out of this today is that uh, even though you have something very popular, very successful, if you don't keep up with the change, then you are bound to fail, as we have seen in the Volkswagen Beetle example, because no matter how successful, how popular it was, how good it was, it uh, could not hold itself any longer in the 1980s because of its uh, nostalgia, let's say, because it could not adapt to the times. And I think for myself that this is the case for us as well. Here are my references, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them.